Data storage is volatile. Ledgers are permanent. My answer to that is, digitize the data, keep your bloody ledgers. No one's going to ask you to throw out the ledgers. You want to sit with, with India ink and, and, and an old feather pen and, and peruse the ledgers? Fine, go ahead. Just digitize it first. Money is better spent on other collections activities. Well, I don't think so. Because if you're spending money on digitizing the collections and exposing them to the world, for analysis and modeling and prediction and policy. You are contributing to the human good in a way that very few other things do. Why is this so hard? Why is this so hard? It's tradition. Here's a, here's a picture from Vermeer, the geographer. Interestingly, he has Vermeer studying, um, he's studying a map, but his globe is sitting up here. And Vermeer has another painting, the astronomer. The astronomer is studying the globe, or at least some kind of globe of the heavens. And they're separate. Now, if through the magic of PowerPoint, I can bring the two of these together to study the same thing, can't we do the same thing at universities? Is the integration across knowledge domains. That's what informatics is about, but it starts with people. Collaborate and network. Collaborate and network from the get-go. Why? Because the infrastructure required for informatics, for biodiversity informatics, is too big to do alone. You can't do it all alone. The institutions required are too big to do alone. Whether it's the data, whether it's the analysis, whether it's the modeling, whether it's the narrative, the expertise required is too big to do all alone. You can't have it all in one spot. Collaborate globally, collaborate internationally, nationally, regionally. Network, network. There are too many disciplines to do alone. Make your data part of a larger community of disciplines. For example, include Besides biodiversity data, climate data, ecosystem data, evolutionary, biological, phylogenetic data, spatial ecology, disease, alien invasives, etc., etc., include mathematics, computational sciences, GIS. It's a community of disciplines. Be part of global science. And perhaps most importantly, or as importantly, don't be proprietary. Implement open source, commonly available, common standard software and tool solutions. Here's an example of what we did at the University of Kansas, not in this order. Ornus, we started Ornus, a network of um, bird collections to digitize their collections. Some 33 collections that we brought together, went to NSF and say, here, here are 33 collections willing to collaborate to digitize their collections and throw it out to the world. Fund us. And they did. Manus, the same thing, the mammal collections, some 30, 40 mammal collections in the United States. OBIS is the Ocean Biogeographic Information System. Fishnet in the United States with all the fishes, which is now expanded to beyond the United States, all the collect 23 collections. And of course, uh, GBIF is taking data, all of these data is being served through GBIF. And HERPnet is 34 collections of HERP. So if you combine, which we have, Manus and HERPnet and Fishnet and Ornus, we now have VertNet run through University of Kansas and Berkeley and I think some others. 
Colorado that is serving all the vertebrate data of some two, three hundred collections worldwide and served through GBIT and maintained and updated. I emphasize this again. Nature, culture, nature, culture. Nature doesn't exist in a vacuum. Combine everything you do with cultural measures and cultural research. If you can, the best way to break down silos at a university is create what I call a skunk works. A skunk works is um, a unit that's free to think outside any of the constraints of a department. Uh, a good example in the United States is, say, the Santa Fe Institute, or at Princeton University, the Center for Advanced Study. MIT has a skunk works. These are faculty who, they get it. They get the interdisciplinarity. And they're freed from the trammels of departmental politics and constraints. They're free to think outside boxes. They come from the humanities, they come from the sciences, they come from engineering, they come from law, they come from economics. They put all together. They come from art. And fantastic innovation is born. We have done this on a small scale at the University of Kansas. It's called the Kansas Commons. Remember that building we got a hold of for archaeology? This is the main hall that's now been that has been renovated for the commons. And all activities in the commons, which combines the Biodiversity Institute, the Spencer Museum of Art, and the Hall Center for the Humanities. Humanities, art, and science are combined in activities in the commons, nature and culture. It's a mini skunk works, and it's evolving. Also, if you, at all possible, feature what you do to the public, explain it to the public, show it to the public through different kinds of exhibits. These are some of our exhibits in the Natural History Museum. So you promote the public understanding of biodiversity, but in a way that, that makes a difference to them. The exhibit should make a difference that they can come away thinking, this is gonna make a difference in my day-to-day -day life. Jorge touched on that when he talked about convincing the public about biodiversity and investing in it. How will it make a difference in their day-to-day -day life? Sorry, can I interrupt you there? Yes. Because I think I'm interrupting you. We have as one of our missions, and this is exactly what you're saying, is actually, it's called turning people into ambassadors for biodiversity. Correct. So you actually, we, we, we do it largely through um, our website, because we don't have a um, place, but we want to give people stories that in our terms, when they go to a braai barbecue, they can talk, you know. You went accessing this morning. Why did you go? And there are answers at various levels. It was fun. Or the bloody ADU needs the data. Right. Or you can say, I am contributing ultimately to a database that's integrally influenced policy. And these are some examples or ideas of how it's happened before. And I think that's exactly what it's right. saying. Right, very good. How are you going to measure whether the institution you set up is successful? I'm going to suggest five measures that you continuously have to keep asking. Does it have novelty? Will it be innovative? In other words, is it the same old, same old? or is it innovative? Will it be significant? Will it do significant knowledge discovery that eventually can be used? Will it be effective? Will its 
activities, its research, its findings, its results, its narratives, will it make a difference? Maybe not today and tomorrow, maybe next month, next year, 10 years. Will it make a difference? Is what you are doing transferable? In other words, can you easily partner in what you're doing with others to make what you're doing even more important, more significant, more effective? Is it transferable? Can others imitate it and work with you? Finally, is it enduring? Will it be enduring? Can it last? Is it is it built in a way that it can be nimble and flexible and adapt with changing times to new challenges, new opportunities? And now I can find the criteria of evaluating the field, those who candidates for the prize. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Finally, I'm getting to the end of this. Follow the mantra, as I said before, of ideas. Lead with and invest in ideas. If everybody always talks about vision, 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 vision. Lead with ideas. There are two kinds of sort of directors. You can regulate, you can be a regulator, or you can lead with ideas. Anybody can regulate. It's hard to lead with ideas. Lead with ideas. Invest in the people to implement the ideas and have them and invest in the tools to make it possible for those people to implement those ideas. In ideas, Follow the Red Queen. The Red Queen is a brilliant evolutionary principle that applies to all of life. You have to keep running as fast as you can just to stay in the same place. Make sure you do that. Don't become static. It's an evolutionary principle. It applies to drugging and cycling where the drugs are one step ahead of the drug testers. It applies to worldwide global military security, where spying is one step ahead of detecting of the spying, and so on. Think strategically. In planning your strategy, in planning your budgets, in planning your activities, think of an investment return portfolio. Three categories of activities. I mentioned them before. Blue chip, high growth, and innovative futures or risk ventures. What are they? Blue chip. That's an investment in the core mission that you have to do day in, day out. It pays dividends every single day. It's a steady return on your investment. It's your core mission. And it's fundamental to keep that going every day to maintain trust and to have success in everything else you do downstream. Whether it applies to content, and that is data and bio collections and research and descriptions, in informatics, the blue chip is your basic technology, your research, your forecasting. And in engagement, these are GBIF terms, but it applies to everybody, is your outreach. Your, in our case, it would be students, knowledge dissemination, teaching, talking to funders and politicians. This is your blue chip activity. Invest in your high growth activity, beyond the blue chip. What's hot now? Invasives, invest. If that's really hot now in your area, invest in them. Disease spread, epidemiology and biodiversity and informatics, boom, go for it. 
Pollination, go for it. Agriculture, go for it. Invest in what is state-of-the-art in biodiversity and informatics and subjects at that time. Invest in goods and services that are needed at that moment. And content in your informatics and in your engagement. Finally, invest in your innovation futures or your risk venture. What is the landscape of the future? Here's where your best thinkers will come in. You'll have to take a chance, but what does the landscape of the future look like? What's over the radar that no one else sees, but that you can take advantage of? I think it's microbes. Well, now it's no longer over the radar, I said it. it if you're successful, it pre-adapts you, to use an evolutionary term, it pre-adapts you to the informatics of the future. You'll be there before anybody else will. And it pre-adapts you to the solutions of the future. So be a leader, not a follower, in all these three areas. In time, of course, the innovation futures becomes high growth, everybody else wants it, and eventually becomes blue chip. So biodiversity informatics was once an innovation future back in 1998 when we invested in it. Became really high growth and spread, and now it's blue chip. If you're not doing it, you're dead. Eventually, becomes extinct. And that's the evolutionary cycle. So I'm going to finish by uh, quoting one of my favorite uh, people. You can always amend a big plan, but you can't ever expand a little one. I don't believe in little plans. Think that when you're designing your institution and forming it. I believe in plans big enough to meet a situation which we can't possibly foresee now. In other words, over the landscape. That was said by Harry Truman, forget President of the United States. And that finishes this presentation. <laughs>